Welcome back to the programme and I'm in studio this morning with uh, Sean Fitzpatrick who is uh, Chairman of Anglo-Irish Bank's former um, CEO of Anglo-Irish Bank. A couple of things I want to come back to because it's been mentioned over and over and over again. And this is that the banks have imprudently, as some would say, recklessly, as others would say, gone with lending into the property market, both commercial uh, and residential and in Britain and elsewhere on foot of valuations that are clearly unrealistic at this point. I mean, Davies were talking about, I think it coming down, was it 30% was Davies' uh, estimate on the, the reduction in the values? Sure, sure. What about that? I mean, isn't that going to leave yeah, banks uh, very vulnerable? Well, it depends on where they are. But look, can we just take a very, very simple example? And just take typically the type of bank, type of lending that banks do, because banks don't just do uh, property lending. So say they lend you money. But uh, it's eighty percent of yours, isn't it? But it's not anywhere near eighty percent of ours. It's less than twenty percent of our book, property. Less than, 20%, Less than twenty percent, because it's widely reported but, in the sorry, papers. That's what that's what they said. I mean, what we do is we do a lot of investment property lending, where we would lend money to you, Marion, for instance, say to buy a property on Grafton Street, which may have McDonald's on the ground floor, Price Waterhouse on the first floor, yeah. and Arthur Cox on the second floor. So you could have our exposure, quite frankly, is to the people their ability to pay the rents. Yeah. So our exposure, quite frankly, is to the fast food business, to the financial services business, and to the legal business. Nothing to do with the property at all, and the property price can go down and. It's totally irrelevant to us. So it's cash flow. But if rentals that. go down, it wouldn't be. But I know if rentals go down, but I mean, rentals are reviewed every five years mm. and they're not going to dramatically change down during that particular cycle. So, so you're saying you have only so, have 20%. Sorry, I'm saying most of the banks have that. that that's it. I mean, maybe some of them have even less. So have all so, these financial journalists misread your books? But sorry, no, they have been told this. I mean, if you just have a look at any detailed um, 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 analyst views, including Dresner, including all the various other people in Citibank, and listen to David Drum, that is the reality of it. So if we're talking about, when I'm ta- what you, I think what you're talking about is cold development. In other words, where people are giving money to buy a site down in Kildare, say, mm-hmm. right? And that's right. Well, that's it. That's exactly it. So if you come along and you talk about, say, 30%, if I can just give you two very simple examples, just nice and, nice and quickly. If we lent you money to buy buy a newsagent shop, say down in Kildare, for say 500,000 uh, and it costs 500,000, you were putting in 100,000, we lent 400,000. So we were getting our 400,000 back off you typically by, and I don't know what the figures are, but just say 5,000 a month over the next 10 years. Now, just say because of the property has gone down, the property price of the property that you bought for 500,000 has now gone down by 30%. So now it's worth 150, it's now it's worth 350, yet we've given you 400,000. What do we worry about if you're continuing to pay your 5000 a month? No problems at all. And we're not going to ring you or get in touch with you at all because that's cash flow. And that is where 80% of our lending is. Now, turn to the other one, then down in Kildare, where a site was bought, say, for $10 million. And just say the developer put in $2 million and the bank put in $8 million. And just say that it's gone down, not 30%, which David said, say it's gone down 50%. Now, if it's gone down by 50%, the property is no longer worth 10, it's worth 5, and the bank is down 3. Now, how can that be sold? Well, will the bank sell it today? No, it won't. Will it push the developer to sell it today? No, it won't. And then you hear other people, ah, they're taking it very easy on developers, they're not pulling the plug. Why would they pull the plug when there's no one going to buy? Bankers, you know, are business people essentially. So they will wait till the market gets better. But in the meantime, they will either get interest from the developer, which will service the loan, or if it's not being serviced... Lend him money make... to pay the interest? No, no, no. They will get interest for it from his own resources. They won't lend it. If they can't get they, money from... They sorry, are Mar- lending it Marian, at the moment. Mar- no, sorry, Marion. They're not lending it. If they're not getting the interest... Okay, what they will do is stop bringing in the interest, the profit and loss account, so the account doesn't go up. And they will make the provisions. And when I listen to people like George Lee, said the banks won't tell us what the figures are. The banks report twice a year, interim results and final results. And they are audited. And they are audited by independent auditors. And if you're telling me that the independent auditors don't have a sense of the concern, of course they have. And they look at each one individually. And that's what's done. In the, also, what you have is you've got risk committees in all the banks, chaired in, certainly in our case, by independent non-executive directors. By the and way, looking at all of those. By the way, would it be appropriate that the government would appoint somebody to those committees? 
that we're going to have to listen to the detail on that. Um, and maybe it is. Uh, but they certainly get full information from our credit committees. They are given a list of all the loans that are approved. If they want to sort of see the background, they've got it all. And maybe put people on board. We must understand as board directors of banks that the world has changed since last Monday and we must understand that the important stakeholder is now the state and the taxpayer and we are going to have to take full cognizance of what they wish and want. Okay, when were you talking to the Minister, by the way? Was that a week ago? I'd say it's about 10 days ago. 10 days ago. Because there were headlines in the paper yesterday. Mind you, they were in the paper on on Sunday. Last Sunday, I read about you and another director uh, putting in, I think you put in 1.1 and he put in 1.3 into shares uh, of Anglo-Irish Bank. And they say now that there's going to be an investigation about insider trading. Yeah, I saw that. I was very, very disappointed to see that story in the Irish Independent yesterday. And I'll just tell you straight out, there is no truth whatsoever in that story. No. Did you not and, have and, a sense but of course, that but the government was going to bail out the banks? No, I didn't have but a you sense. Were, but you sorry, were talking to sorry, Brian Lennon. Sorry, sorry. What I did was, I did, like other directors in the past, was shown confidence in our shares by taking money out of my own resources to buy shares in Anglo-Irish Bank. It is the only way that I could articulate in a very clear way to a wide audience that I believed in Anglo-Irish Bank. And that's what I did. Now, I've been in banking 35 years. Clearly, I had to go through a process to actually get that cleared with our company secretary, with the chief executive of the bank, and that I did. There is no sense that there was anything done But you, But did you not know beforehand that the government was going to bail the banks out? Of course I didn't. That wasn't announced until, the, um, until Monday night. Right, but you've so been talking to the minister the previous week. I've been talking to the minister the previous 10 days about various issues, about what he could do or what might he not might do, but I wasn't sure what he was going to do. And were you bankers, generally, either as the chair, like yourself and Jar McLeese now, were you in constant, they would be your competitors, obviously, always, <clears throat> but were you at this stage all talking to one another? Not on a constant basis, no. No, we weren't. But we would have an idea of what was going on from either the regulator, from uh, people at mid-management level or the senior management level. But as chair, I mean, I'd spoke to um, uh, Jeremy Gleeson, I'd spoken to um, Richard Burroughs, mm. um, and I spoke to Michael Walsh, uh, and I spoke to um, Gillian Bowler. So the all of the chiefs, all of the chairman of that, I spoke to them all within the last... Uh, two weeks or so. Right. And were you all, as it were, trying to form no, a view no, of what you would say no, to the government? No, we weren't. We, there was no cohesive, uh, there was no groups meeting the, um, um, the government at all. So each of the banks uh, would have, because, I mean, again, it's very confidential, and each of them would have been very uh, sensitive to their own particular situation, so they were keeping their powder dry and all of that. Right. Did they call you during the night on Monday? I meant to ask you that. Yes, we got calls. What, what, what time did you get your first call out? Well, I slept right through it. So my first time I heard about it was at six o'clock uh, from uh, our chief executive. Was he on the phone during the night? I think he was on the phone at four o'clock where um, someone from IFSRA had rung him. And was there kind of a conference call with all of the banks? No, I think it was done on an individual basis. And then, of course, we had to wait until the morning to flesh out what in fact had been agreed. Right. Great sigh of relief all around. Without question, Marion. It was a real sigh of relief and a determination that going forward that there's going to be different behaviour in bank boards. We're going to have to look at all of our models to ensure that we're bulletproof against this type of situation again if it ever occurs. How could you do Green, that? Well, I don't know. This is what we're going to have to look at. Greenspan said this is a once in a century uh, occasion. That, that things like this happen. We're going to have to look at that. We're going to have to look at our own model. Uh, we're going to have to look at the way we do our business. We're going to have to look at all of those things. Because and you see, what back people our, are afraid of... And maybe we'll come back with our model, or maybe we'll come back with a revised model. Yeah, because what people are afraid of is that you guys are going to say, phew, happy days, here we go again. Well, Marion, I'll give you a commitment. And the Irish Bank won't do that. It's not happy days, here we are again. Very grateful to the government for what they did. Very mindful that we're given a lifeline to go forward to repair our balance sheets and we know what duties and obligations we have arising out of that chance and we will not be found wanting in them. Still enjoy banking? Well, I'm no longer uh, as an executive, but of course I do, yes. Okay. Uh, Sean Fitzpatrick, thank you very much indeed for talking to us. Thank you.